Hello everybody and welcome back to another technical overview video. Last time we covered the new Black Square Analog Bonanza, this time we'll be looking at the Analog Baron. The two aircraft may have nearly identical fuselages, but with more systems and twice as many engines, the Baron is a bit more aircraft to manage. The Black Square aircraft are some of the first to bring study level complexity to light aircraft in Microsoft Flight Simulator, and the Analog Baron exemplifies that. It combines advanced simulations for fuel-injected engines, pressurization, climate control, door seals, the most advanced turbocharger simulation, and possibly the most advanced failure system outside of a commercial aircraft. Make sure you check out the Analog Bonanza technical overview after this one so you don't miss out on any of the details. Now let's get started. Just like the Analog Bonanza, the Analog Baron is several aircraft in one. From the menu, you can choose from the normally aspirated aircraft without winglets, just like the default one, or a turbocharged and pressurized Baron 58P model, sometimes called the P-Baron, with winglets and tip tanks. Just like the Analog Bonanza, you can also create your own configurations with the config files. Since so many of the systems in the Baron are so closely related to those in the Bonanza, I will let you refer to the previous technical overview video so we can focus on what's new in the Baron in this one. In that video, we covered Black Square's failure system, hot swapping radio panel, turbocharger simulation, the engine data monitor and leaning procedures, and the new radio navigation signal degradation feature, my personal favorite. Climbing into the cockpit of the analog Baron, the first things you might notice that are different from the normally aspirated version, other than the pressurization control panel, are the manifold pressure gauges. They go almost all the way up to 40 inches of mercury, and the needle sits at the current outside ambient pressure around 29.4 inches of mercury. That's because this aircraft, unlike the analog Bonanza, is not a turbo-normalized aircraft. Instead, it's a so-called ground-boosted turbocharged aircraft, meaning that it boosts the manifold pressure up to 39.5 inches of mercury, instead of just maintaining ambient sea level pressure until the critical altitude. Above the manifold pressure gauges, you can also see the low thrust detectors, which we'll demonstrate later in this flight. Turning on the battery master switch, we can immediately see that the cabin is too cold for comfort at 25 degrees Fahrenheit. Luckily, unlike the analog Bonanza, we don't have to wait until the engines are warmed up to start warming up the cabin. This aircraft is equipped with a combustion air heater. Let's turn on the heater and listen to its igniter spark up a fire in the nose of the aircraft. The combustion heater will consume approximately one half gallon of fuel per hour from the left main tank. We can also turn on the blower and open the vents to start warming things up. As you can imagine, having a gasoline powered furnace in the front of your aircraft may be convenient, but it can also be dangerous. And the Black Square failure system will keep you thinking about the consequences of operating this kind of equipment throughout your flight. You might be surprised by a carbon monoxide alarm. In the pressurized aircraft, carbon monoxide can also enter the cabin through the turbochargers, which are used to supply pressurized bleed air for the pressurization control system. If this happens, the two red knobs here can be used to isolate each engine from the cabin breathing air. Just like last time, the aircraft is all configured for engine start, except this time we're going to learn how to start a flooded engine. How did it become flooded? We did it, of course, by running the fuel boost pump longer than we had to while trying to prime the cylinders. If we try to start the engine in this situation, we could crank it all day and not get anywhere because the fuel to air ratio in the cylinders is far too rich for combustion. Let's use an engine start flooded checklist to remedy the situation. We start by putting the mixture to lean and the throttle open just a crack. When we crank the engine, we'll simultaneously advance the throttle and find the optimal mixture for combustion. We can advance the mixture now to full rich and target 1000 RPM. Now we can start the other engine normally. 
Mixture full rich, throttle full open, fuel boost pump on high for two to three seconds with fuel flow greater than three gallons per hour. Throttle open just a crack and then crank the engine. 1000 RPM. Temperatures and pressures are all in the green. We can turn on the alternators and the avionics master switch. Then I will see you out at the runway for a short run up. As we taxied to the runway, our navigation receiver picked up on the faint signal of a nearby VOR station that we had tuned in at the end of our last flight. As we gain altitude on takeoff with respect to the surrounding terrain, this indication will become more confident and provide us with good bearing indication for that station. As a reminder, nearly every system on board a Black Square aircraft is capable of failure. So as we conduct our run-up checklist, we're looking for system failures that could spell disaster for us later in the flight. Parking brake is set, enunciators test and consider. There are three enunciators in this aircraft that are not present in the normally aspirated version. A door seal pressure failure light, cabin altitude high light, and cabin pressure differential high light. Remote compass is slaved and aligned. Mixture full rich. We had the mixture leaned for taxi since this aircraft is capable of spark plug fouling. Throttle up to 1700 RPM and then we'll do a propeller check. We're looking for similar indications as we were with the analog Bonanza except for a increase in oil pressure in a multi-engine aircraft. First the left propeller a drop in RPM, an increase in manifold pressure, and an increase in oil pressure. Then the right side, increase in manifold pressure, decrease in RPM, and an increase in oil pressure. Next a magneto check. First the left, one, two, no more than 150, back to both. Down to one, no more than 150, 50 in between. Back to both, one, two, no more than 150, back to both, down to one, no more than 150, 50 in between, back to both. The magnetos are good. Instrument air pressure is in the green and no lights illuminated. Left alternator off. Its load goes to zero, the other one doubles. The enunciator light comes on. Right alternator off, the battery voltage gets pulled down by the load, both enunciators on. We can turn both back on now, and the battery is charging. Next, the propeller heat. The load should go to about 24 amps. We see that on the load meters. Next, the windshield heat. We should see a blue enunciator light on the glare shield and there is no change in the alternator loads. There's no circuit breaker associated with the windshield heat so we need to go to the failure system interface to see if there's an active failure. Sure enough there is, we'll press reset selected. The blue light should come on and now we should see a difference on the load meters. We can check the rest of the de-icing equipment the same way, each time looking for an increase in the load and they're all good. Next we'll check the de-icing boot pressure. When we move the switch to auto we should see the pressure increase to around 18 psi and then cycle. The cycling is the controller inflating different zones around the aircraft each time with a blue indicator light. When the switch is in the manual position, we should see the pressure immediately go to around 15 to 16 psi, a little bit less because we're de-icing all the zones at once. Next, we need to close the cockpit window and bring the engines up to 2000 RPM for our cabin pressurization checks. You can hear those dynamically generated turbocharger sounds. The cabin altitude should be at field elevation, which is about 500 feet, and the differential pressure should be zero. Cabin climb rate is around the 10 o'clock position, the pressurization goal 1,000 feet below field elevation. 
cabin pressurization mode, pressurize, and the door seals, pressurize. Give the door seals a few seconds to come up to pressure, and then we'll press the cabin pressurization test button. We should see a descent indicated. Now this isn't just a binary operation, this is actually being calculated based on the turbocharger's output pressure, which controls not only the rate, but also the maximum differential pressure that we can achieve at altitude. If we decrease the throttles, we can see that the rate is adjustable based on the throttle setting. Once we're satisfied, we can dump the pressure from the cabin and from the door seals and set our first desired altitude after takeoff. Throttles down to 1000 RPM. We've already seen the autopilot checks in the analog bonanza, so I will now skip ahead to the flight phase and show you some more things. Now that we've arrived at our cruising altitude, we need to reduce the manifold pressure to our recommended cruise setting of 33 inches of mercury, unlike with a turbo-normalized aircraft, where manifold pressure never exceeds 30 inches of mercury. Prolonged periods of operation at manifold pressure settings significantly above sea level can lead to engine damage. We can also turn on our propeller sink and watch the sinker phaser slow down to a stop. We should also close our cowl flaps, especially before a descent, to keep our cylinder heads warm. The next step in our cruise checklist is to lean the engines. As always, leaning begins with pre-leaning before using the EDM 760 to fine tune. If we pre-lean aggressively, we might see a low thrust detector light illuminate. That's how sensitive the system is to power changes. The system is predicated on small pitot tubes on the side of the engine nacelles directly behind the propeller discs, which sense small changes in pressure. If we continue to lean aggressively, we might see a blinking red indication to help us identify the dead engine during an engine failure. Let's lightly pre-lean both engines and then press the Lean Find button on the EDM 760 and see Lean ROP for Rich of Peak. Begin leaning slowly and continuously on either engine until we see Peak EGT. Then advance the mixture until we see a relative EVGT of around minus 75, which will be our maximum cruise power setting. Now we'll do the left engine. Continue leaning until we see peak EGT. Then advance the mixture until about the same minus 75 relative EGT. If we had any doubts that this was our maximum cruise power setting, we can always check the horsepower numbers. Since we're only at 10,500 feet, cabin pressurization is not required. In fact, it's best not to pressurize the cabin as frequently as possible, because pressurization cycles do serve to decrease the integrity of the airframe. We can see that the cabin is not pressurized because the pressure differential is zero PSI, and the cabin pressurization altitude is the same as our cruising altitude. In fact, we can open the window having no effect on our pressurization. For the sake of demonstration, let's pressurize the cabin to half of our cruising altitude. The top of the scale here is our desired cabin pressurization altitude, and the bottom of the scale is the maximum altitude that we can climb to and still maintain that pressurization altitude. Although, as we saw earlier, throttle and engine performance settings can serve to decrease that number. The next step in pressurizing the cabin is to activate the door seals. Since the door seals create a tight seal around the cabin door, they also serve to decrease the amount of wind noise in the cabin. Let's listen carefully. Once the door seals are inflated, we can move the cabin pressurization controller switch from dump to press. We should see a descent indicated, 
and we can control the rate of that descent with the controller rate knob. We should begin to see the cabin differential pressure build up and the cabin pressurization altitude decrease. If we wanted to check the integrity of our pressurization system, we can pull out the isolation valves to make sure that each turbocharger is supplying its own air to the pressure manifold. Next up, I'll show you the engine's performance degradation simulation, and then we'll check in at a higher altitude so you can see more intricacies of the pressurization system. To demonstrate engine performance degradation, we're in the normally aspirated version of the aircraft. Let's watch the annunciator light's brightness increase as I advance the throttles from idle to enter the runway. The alternator RPM increases, raising the bus voltage. I've programmed in significantly fouled spark plugs on the left-hand engine. This might happen if you were forced to wait for your IFR release after the run-up and forgot to lean your mixture. Right now, you might not notice anything unless you were staring directly at the engine instrumentation. However, as I advance the throttles to full for takeoff, we'll begin to see the performance of the left-hand engine lag significantly behind that of the right. At high manifold pressures, we may even hear a backfire. As we advance through 40 knots, we'll see the low thrust detector begin to indicate sporadically, alerting us to poor combustion in the left-hand engine. We'll close the throttles immediately and begin applying smooth braking to ensure that we can exit before the end of the runway. This may also happen as engine condition degrades due to poor management. If you're looking for an aircraft where all of your actions have consequences, then you've come to the right place. We're now up at 24,000 feet, with our combustion heater working overtime to keep us warm, our pitot heats on, and a cabin altitude high annunciator light illuminated, because our cabin altitude is above 11,500 feet. If we look at the pressurization controller, we see that the minimum pressurization altitude that's attainable at 24,000 feet is around 11,700 feet. In fact, we're doing a little better than that, with our cabin pressure differential approaching the maximum of 3.9 PSI. If we look at our cabin climb indicator, we can see a slight climb indicated. If we look at the annunciator panel, now we see a cabin door seal annunciator light illuminated, indicating that either our door seal has somehow become compromised, or the mechanical pump that supplies pressure to the door seals has failed. To remedy this, we'll open the standby door seal valve, which allows us to pull pressurized air from the instrument air manifold. And then, hold down the standby door seal button. In a few seconds, we should see the cabin climb go back to a descent. We may need to press and hold this button again periodically, or consider descending to a lower altitude where pressurization is not required, as pressure will be continuously lost in the door seal system. Next, I'll meet you back on the ground at our destination for one more demonstration. Once safely back on the ground, a good pilot will periodically perform a hot magneto check. We all know what a faulty magneto looks like during a run-up check. When we cycle the switch to the position of the bad magneto, all combustion stops because there's no longer a source for ignition. But this aircraft has 10 magneto-related failures and only 4 magnetos. What are those other failures? Well, they're magneto grounding failures. A magneto is always capable of producing a spark unless it's grounded to the aircraft chassis through the switches. We have two such magneto grounding failures activated right now. Let's bring the right-hand engine up to 1700 RPM as if we're conducting a run-up check. When we cycle the switch through its positions, we'll see that one has no RPM drop associated with it. This means the spark from the other magneto isn't being grounded. That's a magneto failure. When shutting down the aircraft, the hot magneto check consists of moving the switch to the fully off position just long enough to know the engine would shut down if you left it there. As we can see here, the engine continues running and neither of the other switch positions have an RPM drop associated with them. That's a total magneto switch grounding failure. 
This means the engine could start at an inopportune time, like when someone is turning the propeller. And we wouldn't have noticed this dangerous condition if we shut down the engine using only our normal procedure by putting the mixture levers to idle cutoff. That's it for the Analog Baron today. Even though this and the Analog Bonanza's videos combined still weren't enough time to show you half of the features in these amazingly complex general aviation aircraft from Black Square. Check out the Analog Bonanza's technical overview video for even more features and to fill in some of the gaps left by this one. Until then, I wish you all blue skies and I'll see you in the next video.